Hi there, this is Thiru, author of Bitby and welcome to the channel and the Java Dev interview series. This is the third video of our Java Dev interview series. We got very good response for the first two episodes and thank you for that. And in this episode also, we have covered very important questions asked in the Java real-time interviews recently. In this episode, we have covered the topics like Java 8, Spring, Multithreading and other important questions. I hope this will be very helpful to crack your next Java interview. Also, please kindly share these videos and the channel to your friends who are looking for to crack the Java interviews. Also, if you face any Java interviews recently, you can also provide those questions to us. We are providing the form in the below of this video. So without making any further delay, let's start with this episode. So the first question is from Java. You have a given list of employees. You have to prepare a map from the list where key is as employee ID and value as age. And the condition given is you have to use Java 8, which means you can go for a Java streams and you can extract a map from the given list. Here you can see I'm showing a sample employee class which is having employee name, employee ID and age. So if we take some examples for the list that is Elias, Bob and Charlie, they have the names, age and employee ID, right? So now let's try to extract and create a map from that list using employee ID and age. I'm creating a list with three employees having the three employees data that is Elias, Bob and Charlie with the employee IDs and age and then using the Java stream on this list I am using collectors to map to extract a map and you can observe here I am passing two parameters to the to map method first one is employee ID which will act as a key then employee age yep this is the simple solution that will extract the map as desired from the list Moving to the next question, what are intermediate and terminal operations in Java 8? In general, on a given input, if we want to extract a transformed output, we need to perform a several intermediate operations on the given input. So Java 8 supports these intermediate operations, which got executed sequentially one after another. And the output from these intermediate operations fed as input to the terminal operations. So here in the example zone, you can see filter, map, sorted, distinct and limit are intermediate operations in Java 8. Similarly, for each, collect, reduce, find, first, find any, etc. are comes under terminal operations. So at the end, after applying of these terminal operations only, stream is considered consumed and can no longer be used. We can also demo this to the interview with a simple example. Here I have taken list of numbers, filter I applied as an intermediate operation, then call it as a terminal operation. Similarly, in the second example, map and filter are the intermediate operations and for each is the terminal operation. I hope now we are in a position to understand what are the differences between the intermediate and terminal operations in Java 8. Now moving to the next question, what is predicate, consumer, producer and function in Java 8? This is one of the important and very frequently asked question in Java interviews. I recommend you this question is very important for Java 8. So please take a special care of it. So coming to the answer, predicate, consumer, producer and function in Java 8 are nothing but these all are functional interfaces. These were used to represent common operations in a functional style. So coming to the predicate, of course, it's a functional interface which represents a condition or a boolean valued function. As a functional interface, predicate has a single abstract method called test that evaluates the condition and returns a boolean value. Most oftenly, predicate is used in stream operations to filter out elements based on a condition. And next coming to the consumer, it's a functional interface which represents an operation that accepts a single input argument and returns no result. As a functional interface, it also has a symbol extract method called a test which takes a single input argument and performs a operation on that. Consumer is often used in stream operations to perform an action on each element. Here in the example, you can see I am iterating a list using for each which takes consumer as a argument. So actually here the printer is a uh, consumer which takes each element as an input and it print out that element. Coming to the next one that is producer which is also known as a supplier in Java 8. Supplier represents an operation that produces a result of a given generic type. It has a single abstract method called get which returns a new instance or result. Supplier is often used to supply values to streams or to create a new instances. 
Here in the example, you can see we have given an input hello world to the supplier of string type. So when we use a get method on that supplier, it will give us the same result, which we initially given as an input to the supplier. Coming to the final one, that is function. It is also a functional interface, which represents a function and that accepts one argument and produces a result. It has a single abstract method called apply that applies the function to the input argument and returns the result. Function often used in stream operations to transform the elements. Here you can see in the example uh, on the number stream we have applied a map right. This map again taking a function as a argument which is actually transforming the input from int to string. So that is all about the predicate consumer, producer and function in Java 8. This question can also be asked differently in relate with the functional interface and still I hope you are in a situation to understand those questions and answer. Moving on to the next or the fourth question, how do you write method referencing? Can you give any example? This question is again from the Java 8 or relating to Java 8. So method referencing in Java 8 is a compact and expressive way to refer to a method without executing it. It is often used with lambda expressions and stream operations. We have already seen those examples. Here you can see some of the example uh, for the method referencing that is static method reference, instance method reference, constructor reference and array constructor references. These all are the examples of method referencing or different type of method referencing in Java 8. We can also demo all these kind of uh, method referencing. Let's code it. In the example, we have defined two methods. One is static method, another is an instance method. And from the main, you can see we are trying to access the static method using method reference example class name and the static method print message, right? And we have assigned that to the function that is function string void called print message function. As discussed in our last example, this is a function and we can use apply method. Here we are sending the argument as hello world. Of course, it will print the hello world. And the next one is instance reference method. We similarly applying that to the function and we're using a apply method. We're able to access that, right? So you can see clearly there is no difference in the same way. We're accessing both static and method using the method referencing, right? For the next two examples, that is constructor reference and the array constructor reference, we are using supplier and function to store the method references and then we are using them as desired wherever we want. So this is how we can take the advantage of method references in Java 8. Now let's jump to the next question. This question is from multi-threading and the question is how do you create a thread pool? So before answering how we can create a thread pool, I just want to understand you what is a thread pool? And what are the advantages of thread pool? Okay. So a thread pool is a collection of pre-initialized threads that can be used to execute tasks concurrently. So instead of creating the threads at runtime and assigning the tasks, we can create them before and then thread pool can take care of assigning the task using those threads. So alternatively, if you create a thread manually, it's really an expensive operation. Also, the manual threads has to be handled by the user, that is their life cycles, which is a very tedious task in real time, right? So for your information, I'm just listing the different kind of operations we need to handle or thread pool has to handle when a thread is created. So usually those operations are like resource allocation, context switching, thread stack, thread initialization, synchronization overhead and garbage collection. So this is why instead of creating a manual threads, we need to go for a thread pool which system can handle itself or the framework provided by Java can handle it. So first I'm showing you example here how we can create a manual threads. I'm putting a simple for loop and I'm creating a thousand threads and starting them. You can go through this code at any time, uh, no issues. Just before that, uh, I will just show you how these manual threads work. So usually our program will start from the main thread, right? And in our main, we have written a for loop to create a thousand threads, right? So these thousand threads created as a sub threads from the main thread and all these threads, we say Java threads. From the other side, in the perspective of our computer system or the OS, the number of OS threads are depends on the number of cores your system has. 
suppose your system has four core cpu then it can uh, support up to max four voice threads at a time similarly if your system is a eight core cpu then it can support up to uh, eight os threads simultaneously right so usually one java thread occupies one os thread okay which means whenever we assign a task to a thread that is java thread it utilizes one os thread which is very costlier okay so now imagine we have thousand threads and we have only four voice threads right suppose four threads were uh, occupied the four voice threads that means now no voice thread is uh, available and out of these four java threads three went to sleep uh, because they are waiting for some io operations or the io resources we say so exactly at this time you have to allocate the voice threads for the waiting threads but for that you have to fetch the voice threads which are already occupied by the sleeping threads so with the thousand manual threads it's not easy to allocate and reallocate and to free the threads based on their occupancy at the runtime so you can answer this to the interview this is the situation where uh, this thread pool is handy compared to the manual threads as thread pool has the capability to automatically do all these things for you now let's explore the mechanism of the thread pool so coming to the thread pool uh, you can say thread pool is a container uh, where we will create a number of threads in it and all these threads were assigned to the respective tasks since these threads were associated with the thread pool and the executor service framework already provided the mechanism to automate all the manual tasks we need to do when we create the manual threads so that is uh, we already discussed right so here you can see the tasks were in the queue and threads are uh, accessing the task from that queue so whenever any task is completed or it is went into the waiting state the thread will pick up another task from that queue and so the time will be saved here right also the overhead of monitoring and managing of these threads will be taken care by thread pool only here i am writing the code to create the threads using the thread pool uh, we are following the same thing uh, nothing different only here difference is we are using a executor service and we are submitting the each created thread to that so while creating the executor service object we are already defining the number of threads we required in the pool you can see executors dot new fixed thread pool and we are passing the number thousand right so now that executor service has capability of holding the thousand threads then for each thread we are creating a task and we are assigning and submitting right i hope now we are in a position to understand what is the difference between creating the manual threads or using the thread pool so now you can take a note of this code for the thread pool creation on the screen now i'm just popping up uh, what uh, thread pool will do for us uh, in the back end we are already discussed this you can see the points the resource management performance scalability flexibility error handling monitoring and tuning simplifying the code task queuing and shutdown management so overall the executor services leads to more robust scalable and maintainable concurrent applications so apart from the executor service and thread pool executor we have also other ways we can create a thread pool such as fork join framework completable future also we have a custom executor service so that is all about the creation of thread pool and how it works okay now let's move on to the next question that is the sixth one so the next question is again from the multi-threading so if you have already 10 threads which are in running state and if we add an extra thread what will happen and what is the state of that new thread added suppose if we take an example of a thread pool having 10 threads which are already in running state then the behavior of the new threads to be added to the thread pool will be dependent on the how the thread pool is configured and managed for example if you are using a fixed thread pool the thread pool is designed to have a fixed number of threads in the case of 10. When all threads are running, any additional task submitted to the pool will be queued until a thread become available. That is some thread has to be available for the new task. So initially, if a new thread is added to the fixed thread pool, the new thread will be in waiting state until any other thread completed its task. That is any of the running threads would be closed or freed. On the other hand, suppose if you are using a custom thread pool instead of fixed thread pool, then it is different scenario. In case of custom thread pool, the behavior will completely depend on how you have implemented the thread management and task queuing. 
So in summary, you can say if you attempt to add an extra thread to a thread pool that is already has running threads, the additional thread will typically be queued or rejected based on the thread pool's configuration and the current state of its task queue. Okay. So now let's move to the next one and this question is from the REST APIs. The question is what are the best practices should be done for REST APIs? This is one of the very very common and the important question. So here clearly I have mentioned all the points for uh, some of the categories. You can go through and just take a look of this list and note it down. I don't want to waste much of time on this question here as it's pretty straightforward. So moving to the next question, this is from the Spring Framework. Uh, the question is, can we pass request session to session scope bin? So before answering this question, you should have idea what is the request session and what is the session scope. You don't worry, I will take you through these scopes and of course you will understood then why the interviewer is asking this question. So if you see the request scope bin, the bin is created and managed per HTTP request that is it is limited to that particular request only or this bin lives until that request completed. On the other hand, the session bin is tied to an HTTP session and lasts as long as the session does. So comparing between the request scope bin and session scope bin, you can say session scope bin has more time of living than the request scope bin since request scope bin ends with the request completion only. So as per the question, there can be a problem if we pass request session to session scope because the requested scope bin may not be available when the session scope bin is still alive, right? So the interviewer's next question is how can you tackle this problem now? So what you can do now is you can take help of at the rate scope annotation which is provided by the spring again. This annotation helps with proxy mode to safely pass a request scoped bin into a session scoped bin. Which means it can pass the data from the request scope bin before it's dying and it hand over it to the session scoped bin. So spring is providing some passes, some safe passes to delegate or hand over the data from request scope bin to session scope bin. Okay. I will show a demo code for this annotation how we can use and how can we achieve this. Uh, you don't worry about that and before that we can just go through what are the different kind of spring bins just for your reference here. I am just displaying here on the screen. So in spring singleton bean follows the singleton design pattern. So the singleton bean will be created only once per container and doesn't matter how many times you requested it, it will create only once. And coming to the session scoped bin, we already discussed this bin will be available for the entire session that is entire user session and this will be created every time a session is created. And I also explained you that request scoped bin will be created on every request or we can say every HTTP request right. Now carefully listen, people usually confuse between this request scoped bin and the prototype bin because their definitions everywhere quite sound similar, very similar. But when you dwell into the use cases of this prototype bin and the request scoped bin, they are very different and they have the significant differences. The prototype bin will be instantiated each time it is requested. Which means for prototype bin, it doesn't matter whether it's a same HTTP request or a different HTTP request, it can be created multiple times. And one more difference is Spring Container is responsible for instantiation of this prototype bin, but the client code is responsible for managing the bin's lifecycle after it is obtained from the container. And the last one is the global session bin, which is again a single bin definition to the lifecycle of a entire global HTTP session. It is not limiting to the only one HTTP session, it is entire HTTP session of the application. So that is all about the different kind of the spring beans. Now moving to the actual question, that is the implementation, how we can pass request session to session scope bin, we can see the code now. I hope now you are clear with everything on the beans. So now we need to do two simple steps that is whatever we receive the request that is request scope bin from the controller we will extract or get the data from the request and we will inject the data into the session scoped bin. So for this safe injection we are taking the help of at the rate of scope with proxy mode which is provided by the spring again. 
so here is the first part we are creating a session scoped bin and we are telling that it is a proxy mode session scoped bin which means this session scoped bin has the ability to receive the data from the request scoped bin next i will define a controller from where we will get the request so in the first controller method that is login uh, i'm trying to get the username and the credentials and you can see if those are valid i'm just setting that username to the session scoped bean that is right session scoped bean dot set username username so this is one request that is login request after that user is making one more request to the one more control method that is slash user right so in this new request what i am doing is i am trying to obtain the username which is passed in the previous request that is in the uh, login request which means you achieved that the data passed to the request has been passed to the session scope bin right you can take a note of this code and we'll move to the next things so moving to the next question that is ninth one uh, difference between at the rate of bin and at the rate of auto void annotations if you know spring this is pretty straightforward question and the very basic one so both these annotations were used for the dependency injection in spring but they have different purposes at the rate bin is used to define a bin explicitly whereas auto void used to inject dependencies automatically to another bin so at the rate bin can be placed dot methods inside a configuration class which is defined at the rate configuration annotation to manually declare a bin so these at the rate bin annotated methods will uh, return a instance of the class that will be managed by the spring container hence this is useful whenever you need to customize the creation of bin or when the bin needs parameters that are not easily auto void right on the other hand at the auto void annotation can be placed on fields constructor or setter methods so that spring can look for a bin of the required type in the application context and, and inject it wherever the auto void is applied so to demo these annotations i have written a code snippets uh, left side you can see i have defined a class using at the rate of configuration okay inside i have written two methods uh, and annotated with at the rate of bin okay so now these two methods are qualified to get instantiated by the spring and in the second part of the code you can see i have used auto void on the setter and the constructor and i'm injecting again these the same beans only right my service and my repository so this is how at the rate of bean and at the rate of auto void annotations works in spring moving to the uh, very last question of this episode uh, this question is if you are an experienced developer or uh, definitely this question you might have faced and the question is what is performance testing and what tools you use for basic performance testing generally so performance testing is a process that is testing of apis which involves testing an api to determine how it performs under different conditions uh, like loads high concurrency traffic spikes etc so why usually teams perform this is to ensure that the api can handle any expected and unexpected load or traffic and maintain its response times and ensure reliability under stress you can see in the first point i have mentioned there are various factors they will measure to define the performance criteria that is response time throughput error rate concurrent scalability latency etc i recommend you to go through the each point and make a little rnd so that you will aware of these performance testing factors and the these what we say keywords i am also popping up uh, what are the generally tools used for the performance testing uh, you might have experienced some of them so i am ending up here you can go through the remaining video for this question i hope this episode is very useful so please don't forget to subscribe the channel and share the channel with your friends who are looking for java dev interviews these or the questions might be helpful for them to crack their next java interview